Hi students, glad to be back with you here. Today we're going to have a lecture on, that focuses on the real life, real world examples of the natural resource curse uh, in Africa and especially in Nigeria. By this point, you've read a lot of work by political scientists that lay out the theory of the natural resource curse. You should have a good understanding of the problem. You should have a list of the manifestations or symptoms that usually appear in uh, states. And you should have a sense of how the, the, the economists and political sciences have been trying to explain the origins of this problem since the 1950s. In this example, we're going to move beyond that. We're going to give you, as I said, a real world example and start looking through other fields at possible uh, reasons that it exists and a case study from a very specific place, Nigeria, which is oftentimes considered the archetypical case of the resource curse in Africa. Before we move into the slides, I just want to give you a little bit of background on um, oil companies in Africa. They've been there since the turn of the century distributing products and did have an impact on politics and events in their own way. Production didn't begin on the continent until after the World War II, so that was in the 50s and 60s that exploration and production began. And there was an issue of timing when we look back at history and that that is also the period that African nations were getting independent. So it was not good luck to be having the oil industry starting at the same time nations are starting. We'll look at that as a source of some of the problems. So um, production went on throughout the last half of the 20th century, but by the 1990s we were looking at something that was called the African Bonanza. And there was quite a lot of exploration and new development in Africa in the late 90s and into the 2000s. So it's a brief overview of kind of periodization of how oil has worked in Africa. And we'll move on to some slides now. This map shows you Africa's West African producers, which were the earliest producers. This is called the Gulf of Guinea, and the oldest producers are Nigeria, Angola, and Gabon. They've been producing since the 50s. Other countries have recently come online, like Ghana and Ivory Coast. But in general, this is called the Gulf of Guinea, and it's been the source of oil throughout the last half of the 20th century for the global market. As I mentioned before, there was a new scramble for Africa, for African oil in the late 90s and early 2000s. And this is a map that represents what was happening at that time. If you see the yellow is where production had already started. Pink is where exploration was being undertaken. And blue is countries that were offering concessions for exploration. Also on the map, if you want to expand this later and look at it, you'll see that there's um, derricks and pink lines representing established onshore operations and pipelines that already exist on the continent. So this is what actually made me become interested in studying African oil. I wasn't in this field in the beginning. I was a historian of pre-colonial Africa. But moving to Houston in the 1990s after I finished my PhD and got the job at UH, I saw all these African leaders coming back and forth from Houston, kind of silently. It wasn't reported in the news. And my neighbors were going to Africa all the time because so many people work in the oil industry. And this is kind of what instigated my idea of um, how, what can I do scholar in scholar in scholarly terms about, the, about oil in Africa and its history. Part of the reason was most of the people that were asking me, my neighbors, why is Africa so poor and why are there so many dictators? And it was hard after studying Africa for you know, nine years, getting a PhD, to hear those questions and not be able to answer them at a dinner party. So this is part of why I began teaching the course and writing a book on this topic. And it was all situated in this late 90s, early 2000s kind of push what was called the African Bonanza, where many, many people were going to Africa and trying to explore. I also need to state that this happened partly because of 9-11. Uh, the Bush-Cheney administration focused on Africa as an alternative source of oil after um, the 9-11 attacks so that we wouldn't have to be dependent on less reliable, problematic Middle Eastern states. In the late 90s and the early 2000s, there were a lot of benefits for oil companies moving into Africa and establishing new operations. The quality of oil in West Africa is very high. It's called sweet crude. That means it's low in sulfur and uh, there's less processing. It's also better for the environment. So that's a real plus. You don't always find that. Direct shipping across the US, across the Atlantic to the US was another plus. And another thing is that the new producers in Africa oftentimes would be forced because they didn't have the technology or the knowledge to accept deals where they were not getting as much of a percentage of the profits. 
this goes along with the fact that African oil producers have never unified to protect their interests as a bloc like the way the um, OPEC nations have. There are some African nations who joined OPEC, but in general they have not united. So the oil companies could make deals with each nation depending on uh, what the risks were. Now, oil companies also have risks in that most of the new developments from the 90s on were offshore deep water uh, developments, and those are very, very expensive up front. Also, there's a problem with the politics of Africa, which we'll get into a lot more, in that sometimes the governments are authoritarian, sometimes they're in stable governments, or as you'll see in the film, The Big Man, film Big Men, you will see that the oil company did not prepare for the fact that an election was coming and things might shift for the terms of their contracts. So <clears throat> even in the most stable democratic states, this risk of having your terms of contract change or the situation change is something that's common in Africa. Another thing, and we'll talk about this a lot in this class and other classes, is conflicts with local populations when you're doing your work onshore. And there's this case we have today of Nigeria will explain where that how those problems came about. Another thing is a reputational risk, which is really new after the 1990s. Well, it started in the 70s that companies had to worry about what their shareholders and what the general American population thought about where they operated and who they've paid their revenues to. So in some cases, when we've got a very authoritarian dictator type leader, your shareholders or the American public could be angry. They could, they could um, ask for a create a boycott to get you to change your policy and not give the revenues to that leader if he's if they're completely if they're really doing bad things in terms of humanitarian uh, human rights and environment and there is this new element that we'll talk about how this came about but non-governmental organizations have become watchdog groups for oil companies so they report what's happening on the ground and that is a new kind of equation for oil companies to deal with in full force after the 1990s this is where we see the rise of what we call corporate social responsibility, where companies begin to deal with this in new ways. This leads us to, again, what we've talked about a lot, and I'm taking here a quote from your bottom of the barrel about what the natural resource curse is with a just blanket explanation. Another term is the paradox of plenty, because so many re revenues come in, oftentimes you would think that countries would become immensely wealthy and develop and lead towards a form of industrial modernization that's great, and that hasn't happened. So the key here is uh, this, this definition. When taken as a group, all oil-rich, less developed countries, dependent on oil experts, have seen the living standards of their populations drop dramatically. You can see below that per capita incomes have plunged in all of these states, not all of them African. And this is important to understand the dynamics of much of the conflict we see in the world today. Um, in general, here's a good, again, another kind of de explanation of what happens. Poverty is exacerbated. Countries perform worse on a lot of economic indicators. And the big issue here, oftentimes that leads to conflict, is the expectation that people are going to have a better lifestyle and the reality that they don't because of various manifest manifestations of the oil curve. So that leads to conflict. This is a long slide that we have here, but what I'm trying to do is list this is my way of teaching when I introduce the manifestations or symptoms of the natural resource curse, the oil curse, or even the theory called rentier theory. And these you've read about in some of the readings, and these are my words on the left, and those are polit political science terms on the right. So I just want you to be able to put the two together because I don't always use political science terms. I'm not a political scientist. So the onset of Dutch disease, and I liked how Professor Kennedy pointed out to you that there are two parts to this. Oftentimes journalists just think it means the whole oil curse, and it doesn't. But what it is is the first part is an appreciation of local currencies, which makes your terms of trade difficult. Your exports become more expensive and imports become cheaper. And that leads to less production in other sectors beyond oil. So that's the first part is appreciation of currency the second part and impact on trade and then the second part is all the revenues and efforts of development in the state tend to migrate towards the new sector which would be the oil sector so if you have a country that has good manufacturing and agriculture that's very vibrant they are going to slow down and they're going to die out in some places dutch disease actually came from the case from the case of the dutch who had a, ga a gas boom and this happened to their economy and it was noted by economists and thus given this name
But imagine also if you have a country that doesn't really have a manufacturing sector, what, how is that going to impact things? Because this is the case in developing nations, some developing nations, especially in Africa. Then we have this other one that was called rent-seeking behavior, a hyper-focus on access to revenues by politicians. Oftentimes, it's a, what's seen as a zero-sum game. You either get the revenues or you don't. So politi politics can become brutal, and seeking the highest position in the state can cause to political turmoil and violence. Increased authoritarianism and military spending is also um, a big issue. Allocation instead of taxation. This means that you've got a lot of revenues, you don't tax the people. As D Professor Kennedy said, you know, if you don't tax people, then they have no form, no reason to call for representation, and it impacts democracy. But also buying off people, buying consent by uh, spreading the money out to opponents is a common characteristic. Something not mentioned in any of the literature is important to understand is that governments become bloated because the one source of revenues are the oil revenues and you've got to get into the government in order to get that. So people can get jobs in some nations that really they don't do much in, but they're officially on the, on the roll and they'll get their salaries and the government can grow beyond all forms of functionality with people getting jobs where they're not actually doing that much, but are getting access to the revenues. We've already noted that the oil industry is capital intensive, so they're after a first initial boom with building of you know, the, the infrastructure, we end up with something called enclave production where there's not a lot of employment and the production is done in a kind of a small community. And it doesn't, a big problem in African and other developing nations is there aren't a lot of backward linkages. Although they try, many countries try to create this, the wealth is not spread out because it's kept within an enclave. Also not talked about in those political science articles was environmental degradation. We'll spend a lot of time in this, and we have our next professor, Jason Terrio, actually doing a whole course on that. We also have what was mentioned in the literature about fluctuating prices of oil. So that is a problem because you can't plan. You might have a five-year plan for how you're going to develop the infrastructure or agriculture or manufacturing, but then the oil price drops into no, not because you, your state could do anything, but because of global markets. And then your projects are going to fail, and that's a really on big ongoing problem. An initial boom and an eventual crash, we'll talk about that a lot. Um, we have an entire lecture on that in the 1980s in Nigeria. And then back to the same thing about high expectations versus the reality of lower living standards because of all these problems. I want to just point out um, really quickly that, you know, a lot of people say, why can't the African nations be like Norway? They did so well with their gas, you know, the North Sea developments. And we have to really pay attention. If you're going to go into the oil industry, you're going to study this, you're going to write about it. You have to really pay attention to the history of each state. So in Norway, we had an effective state that could provide what we considered normal services, functional good services for its citizens established really actually before 1814, but that's when a constitution came about. So they've over the years created a very strong democracy. They have an ability for the public to have wide scrutiny of their government and make comments and pay attention to what's going on. They've had strong trade unions, an effective welfare system. They had all these things as well as a diverse economy with both industrial and manufacturing, um, with industrial and manufacturing bases and agricultural. This all happened. This was there in place before their, um, before the oil and gas industry began. So they were able to manage things in a much different way than West African nations. As I said, they began their production in the '60s, and their states were being given freedom from colonial rule in the '60s. So they're weak and unstable states, and they remain so in some places today. There was really no democracy under col colonial rule. And transitioning to a form of democracy in the 50s and 60s was very difficult. We'll study that a little bit in more detail. There is a lot of what we call opacity in African governments following the colonial model. So the people at top don't always tell the public what they're doing with revenues or tax laws, those type of things. Um, there is not a gigantic civil society such as trade unions um, or the churches are organized and that's a main form of groups that can be activists and call the state to task, but there isn't a lot of that um, that's able to deal with the state in African societies after colonialism. No welfare provisions, no diversity in the economy, mostly um, under colonial rule they were producing one or two key crops that were put onto the global market, they're called cash crops. And diversifying is a very difficult task, changing the whole trajectory of your state economy has been difficult.
And again, no real manufacturing base, as you saw from the structuralist argument in, Dr. in the Ross article. Structuralists are the Marxists who were putting out these views. Um, what happens in many developing nations, especially Africa, is raw materials are shift, shipped out and then processed or manufactured goods are shipped back. So this profit that would be made between the transition of a raw material to a processed product that could be sold on the global market, that is lost for Africans. It goes to the outside people who are taking those resources out. So we're going to look now at Nigeria, and this is the general country. It's got a capital city called Abuja. The former capital used to be Lagos. Abuja was built off of oil revenues and chosen to be specifically in the center of country uh, in, the 80s, in the 1980s and 90s to be a more neutral area. And that is because Nigeria itself was originally comprised of three very distinct peoples and, in fact, states by the British under colonial rule. And um, not only were there three distinct states that are basically divided by that river you see there, and we'll come back to that, but there's this issue of a lot of different language and ethnic groups in Nigeria. These were people who never had, well, in the west they had a centralized kingdom, in the north they had Islamic uh, empires, and in the southeast they had societies that were non-centralized where they decided not to organize in a form of a state. So imagine putting all these together for 100 years and forcing production under colonialism and then selling them in the 60s, all of a sudden you're free, create a state out of this. There's still ongoing difficulties between the three regions and between the various peoples who have their own language group, their own religious systems, and their own cultures. If you see on the bottom, that's where Nigeria is on the map of Africa. So in the late 90s, I'm using the 90s and early 2000s because a lot of the data is from this. Some of this still is relevant today, but I don't have the exact numbers for um, you know, 2016. So at, in the 90s, the population was about 100 million. We know it's 140 today, but th the population of Nigeria is very, very dense. One out of five Africans is a Nigerian. It was the ninth largest producer of oil, and it, its peak in the early 2000s was 2.6 million um, barrels per day. In the last few years, it's gone down we, because of production in the U.S. We don't even import um, Nigerian oil anymore. So it's gone down to 2 million. A lot of that going to other places around the globe, including China. Um, also, in the early 2000s, Nigeria was supplying 10 to 12 percent of, of U.S. oil. And in fact, by 2005 or 7, before we had our own production pickup in the U.S., we were getting as much as 27 percent of our oil nationally from African nations, not just Nigeria, but from Africa. So here we see below some problems of the resource curse because oil is 95 percent of its exports. Oil accounts for 80 percent of the government revenues. Oil gave up to 45 to 50 billion per year in revenues. There's a, that number of 500 billion since the 60s is probably much higher as far as revenues coming into Nigeria. And I put this last point here because they're organized, the contracts with the international oil companies under joint venture agreements. And I wanted you to know that um, the deals that Nigerians have been able to negotiate are quite good. They get 60% of the profits before taxes and the oil companies are getting 40%. There's a long history about how this evolved around the globe so that producers would get a higher percentage. We'll get into that later. But um, Nigerians have got good deals. They're not being exploited by the outside oil companies in terms of these joint venture agreements. But here's the problem. We still have a lot of, well, we have no real development. Here's some, according to the World Bank, 80% of the oil revenues are going to 1% of the population, who are probably offshoring a lot of that. 70% um, of private wealth is held abroad, in fact, that's what I just said, and three-quarters of the Nigerian population is living on less than a dollar per day. So that's a gigantic schism between wealthy and poor, which is going to cause some serious uh, conflict in the nation. Percentage of people living under the absolute poverty line in 1981 was 27%. In 1999, it went up to 66%. So we're not seeing a progression towards a better lifestyle for the majority of Africans we're seeing a progression towards decreased standards of living. The same with the malnutrition rates. People are aware of this problem, and this is a minister of a state for finance. And, you know, Nigerians are brilliant. We've got Nigerian doctors over here. They're one of the most successful immigrant groups. If you go there, you'll be astounded by just the amazing depth of conversations you're going to be having with these well-educated people. So they understand um, that there's a problem with this. For example, this woman says, if we hadn't discovered oil, we would have been better off today. Once we had oil, our agriculture sector collapsed. Oil has made us lazy. When I was growing up, I knew I had to use my brains to succeed. 
the oil generation doesn't feel this. We have become corrupted. So people try to grapple with it, and there's amazing histories of people trying to deal with this, of uh, different finance ministers. So Nigerians are not sitting around just haplessly, but it's just this combination of effects that have made Nigeria kind of an archetypical case of the problems that can arise. This is a long list of different governments, but what I wanted to call back was this issue of the zero-sum game and getting access to revenue. So we see a lot of different leaders in the Nigerian government, and up until really the late 90s, there were not good stories about how they were taken out. They'd be attempted coups, or they'd be assassinated, or um, many of them were military governments. So we have a long history of kind of government leaders le coming in and out. If you notice in 1984 to 85, it was Buhari who was a military leader, and now he's back in power in 2015, and he's a civilian leader, so he's not using military rule. The good news is from Nigeria, military rule has kind of gone out the window and civilian rules in charge. A former ambassador to the region explains um, to the state, explains that what's happening now is you've got about 10 elite families and they tend to pass the leadership between them and they're divided across the various ethnic groups. So <clears throat> those three regions are represented in um, the ethnic groups except for the one oil producing region. The first time anybody from that region got into power was Jonathan Goodluck or Goodluck Jonathan in um, 2010 to 2015. So those minority groups have not seen a big role in government and that's been a source of uh, uprisings, insurgency and conflict in Nigeria throughout time. These are the states that were established under British colonial rule and the northern region was largely Muslim, the western regions, the Yoruba, the eastern region was um, Igbo and some smaller minority groups. And the Midwest region was created right before a civil war broke out. In the 1960s, oil was discovered and that instigated the people in the eastern region under a leader called Ojukwe to break away and try to create their own state because they did not want the revenues coming from their area to be spread to all these other people who weren't suffering any of the effects. So that Nigerian civil war was very big in global history. Um, it's the first time that American citizens saw starving people and um, it's just for humanitarian causes, starving Africans, it's just a really big thing we'll talk about later on. But know that a war happened from 1967 to 1970 and it was really essentially around oil and who was gonna get access to the revenues. This is a map about that and that's the whole region that took off the government at the time that separated off as a secessionist movement. The government at the time tried to create the Midwest state and um, to take away some of the power from that eastern region. By the, 1970, if you see that green part on the map, that's the only area that they were able to control. So they lost the war and um, the repercussions are that, of that is that region has often been, especially the oil producing regions, they have not been developed by the state. They've been left aside. So no schools, no hospitals, and it's just oil companies and people down there and people who are not getting access to the revenues are unhappy with the environmental devastation and suffering for a period of 30 to 40 years. So here's another example of the oil curse in that when you want access to the revenues, you're gonna change laws to make sure that the leadership gets access. So pointing out here when Shell when the British were in charge of, of uh, Nigeria, they gave Shell exclusive rights to explore. Later on, they wanted more exploration and more revenue, so they let independent companies come in in the 50s and 60s. But the rule when they started talking about leaving Nigeria was that oil revenues were gonna be split between all three regions. After the war, which is in 1969, it's like at the very tail end, the government, the federal military government, says every single dollar from the revenues is coming to us. In 1975, they changed that so that 80% would go to the federal government, 20% to the regions. And as you see, it devolves and it gets a little better, but even by 1999, only 13% of the revenues are going to the oil producing regions, which again is gonna be a problem of, uh, it's gonna cause problems of conflict. This is an interesting map because after the Civil War, there was a proliferation of states, no longer just three states, but 36 states. And what we need to think about in this is the fact that I used to look at this and say, wow, Nigerian government's really together because each ethnic group gets to have its own autonomy. But there's a downside to this because each ethnic group wants its own autonomy because of the fact that then they are a state, an official state, and they get a certain percentage of the resources. So this could be considered a non-functional example of the bloating of the state, where new states 
um, are created to get access to those resources or distinct ethnic groups are starting calling themselves nations in order to get a cut of the resources under the federal legislation. So that's an example of bloating of the government that may not be so functional. Here we have just a picture of the landform and the ecological diversity. In the Niger Delta, because of the pipelines and the onshore production that happened up until the 90s, um, there's been extreme ecological devastation. And it's one of the most ecologically diverse um, locations in the globe. It's mangrove forests with, look at all those rivers. I show you this because I want you to understand the riverine life. We'll have um, Dr. Golden Timsar talking to you in a class about this and about the youth who revolted there and how important it was to their masculinity and the religions they were using to rebel and rise up against both oil companies and the states. These are just pictures of operations and um, these things, these, these, this infrastructure was put in in the 50s and 60s and another issue about the oil curse is when you look at the full life cycle of the project, these are now getting very old and pipelines are breaking and storage facilities are not as effective and we need to look at the long-term implications of having, uh, we're having this in the US too with pipelines built in the 60s, um, no longer working as well and breaking. These are some, this is another example of how it was done onshore in Nigeria, starting in the 60s. More, and if you notice, there's some flaring in the back, which has been an ongoing problem in Nigeria with um, the gas is not being captured and used for any kind of productive purposes. It's just being flared as production goes on. And then we want to just show you here some examples of how Nigerians in the producing regions have had to live cheek by jowl. These children are probably going to school and they're using the pipelines to walk on. And that's something we don't like to see in America. We don't like to live so close to this stuff. Here's an example you'll see many times as we go through the class of women who actually dry their uh, products. This is cassava next to the flares. Um, that, using that process next to a flare takes three hours versus you know four days in the sun. So they've been able to make money off of this, but of course you know the risk of being right next to a flare and the fumes and the different chemicals that they're ingesting. This picture, you'll hear this story a lot, is that some kids live in villages where they've never seen, um, really, they've been raised in villages where they've never seen the light of, uh, the dark of night, that the flares have gone on through their entire 20 years of existence. This, we're gonna get into a lot more, but I want to just say this is a hospital that was built by an oil company as an act of, you know, trying to help the people. But the problem is no doctors wanna live in this region because it's so um, devastated and there's real, really, it's not a nice place to live. So many times the oil companies and the engineers will come in and build buildings, but to actually create development in the region through health or education or roads, it's not always gonna happen because people don't always want to live there beyond the people who are getting oil revenues and working for the company. This is an example of just how the blocks offshore are being divided up. And nowadays in West Africa, much of the uh, work is done offshore in deep water. And that is good for oil companies that avoids a lot of the local conflicts, but it is not good for the nation state in terms of the revenues are still coming in and there's still questions about um, where, where, how they should be distributed. It doesn't take away the problem for the nation. It does sometimes for uh, the oil operators. And we will go through this more later, but I just want to say a basic trajectory of resistance. In the 1980s, women and young youth, men, got together and organized in protest and would kind of uh, go up. We'll see some films where they're doing this. They'll take over platforms or um, flow stations. And they were met with repression, but that was the beginning of this movement. By the 1990s, there was this journalist, poet, and politician named Ken Sarawiwa who fought, created an organization in the name of his people, which was MOSOP, Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People. He went and got with the people who owned like the body shop and created a transnational movement where people around the world became conscious of what was happening in the environment. But this angered the Nigerian government and he was executed in 1996 with nine other men. He was hung without a fair trial. Shell was then sued by the family and Shell settled on that um, suit as late as I think in 2012 or 13 and we'll talk more about that but um, on basically saying there's this is the origins of a non-violent group called Mosap and from this another group developed after he passed away which was not non-violent was was very violent and um, Dr. Golden Timsar will talk about this insurgency but when people tried to rise up, this is what would happen. The Nigerian government would come in from the federal government and destroy things. 
So it's a very intense situation in Nigeria. This is a chief who talked about it in 2005. It's like paradise and hell. They have everything, we have nothing. If we protest, they send soldiers. They sign agreements with us and then ignore us. We have graduates going hungry without jobs and they bring people from Lagos to work here. And they means the oil company and they means, you know, many of the people who work for the oil company are Nigerians. About 85 to 90% of the employees are Nigerians. So that's the face of the company, but the problem is those are not Nigerians from the region. And so that's why they're saying they're angry about bringing people from Lagos. So it's not their own ethnic group and their own people are not getting jobs beyond maybe some security in the region. This got a lot of attention in um, around 2005 because one insurgent, one movement where they captured the, a flow station actually caused the global price of oil to go up by $5 for a period of three or four weeks. So this has become a big, this was a big thing in the early 2000s. This is a map that talks about things that would happen there because the rebels would take over drilling stations, flow stations, pipelines, and platforms. And oftentimes they'd take hostages and hold them for ransom. I was in a State Department um, meeting once where they were, at the beginning of this, we were giving $250,000 per individual, the oil companies were. So um, this is an effective way of making revenues in this region. Another way is breaking into the pipelines and getting the oil and selling it uh, illicitly, and that's called bunkering. Dr. Golden Timsar will spend a lot of time talking to you about that. This is an example of an insurgent group. They get the revenues um, on their own and have very effective weapons. These weapons were higher quality than the actual government had. And um, they would go through speedboats and attack the flow stations. And this is another example of some and the last two slides I'm going to show you is how important this is globally because our own government, uh, the U.S. government and the Pentagon created something called AFRICOM in 2007, shifting our focus away from uh, Europe and the command station in Europe. It was recreated in Africa and we have our own command for Africa now. And this is the way the U.S. government looks at opportunities for Africa but also opportunities for itself. So we have the hydrocarbon deposits in the Gulf of Guinea, which I showed you the map in the beginning. Mineral reserves are very big all the way through Central Africa down into South Africa. M much of the world's gold and diamonds come from there. Equally important is Central Africa and Congo's coltan, which is a mineral that we use in our cell phones and, we can, and our computers, and we cannot live with that. And there's only a few places on the globe that produce that. Those areas there where coltan is produced have been in a war for about 20 years with a lot of... Um, the minerals are being taken out through small, small kind of warlords. It's quite a mess there. So the Pentagon noticed this and started working on Africa and noticed the arrows showing that the hydrocarbons are going out to North America and to Europe. Um, this is also challenges, and this is the last slide I'm going to show you, but I want you to, to know that since um, 9-11 under both uh, Bush and the Obama administrations, our policy towards Africa has been militarizing Africa. So we send the military there and we train many of the national government militaries um, to be effective against extremists coming in. So there is a real problem of terrorist expansion in Africa, as you know. And as time developed, you know, the Nigerian state really was not effectively taking care of its people. And it had all the insurgents in the south, the pictures I just showed you, but over time, with support from um, Islamic, Islamic, Islamic extremists in the north, the people under Islamic rule have taken up this kind of uh, you know, ISIS approach. So the group there is called Boko Haram, and I'm sure you've heard the news where they captured 300 girls, and it's really a problem. So Nigeria's problems have shifted from the south because the government paid, created an amnesty. Dr. Golden Timsar will talk to you about. Things are a little calmer there, but now in the north, we have all these problems. So none of these problems would exist if Nigeria had managed its oil revenues better, had been able to spread the wealth better, had ensured the progress, education, good health, and happiness of its own citizens. So this is why it's a quite extreme case in Nigeria. We said many, many of the manifestations. It's a good case to start with because then we can take this case as an extreme and move it to other regions of the globe and compare. In, at UH, we often have uh, Africans coming for consultation, like say the Liberians started an oil industry and when they got, Liberians and Tanzanians both, and the first thing these nations say when they're coming online, the first thing they say is how can we not be Nigeria? We don't want to be Nigeria, what can we do? And so this course that we're teaching was developed to help 
those people answer those questions, we, we're going to teach them abroad and, and also have you who perhaps will go into the oil industry think about, be exposed to and think about these issues so that when you go on to the job, you'll be able to make much better decisions that help to avoid the problems in the future. Sounds far-fetched, but that's our dream and, you know, reality only changes through dreams. So thank you for listening. So students, what we've shown you here in this video is the case of the natural resource curse as it manifested in one country, in Nigeria. We'll come back to the case of Nigeria many times throughout the course and throughout the certificate if you go on to take our other classes. We began here by pointing out real world examples of the manifestations on the ground, putting the theory that you've learned through the political science readings into place in a specific country. In our class, we want to move beyond the political science approach because it focuses mostly on state actors and state policies. And we will, from here on out, be focusing a lot on other factors, business cultures, community cultures, uh, finance, and concepts of time, lots of, of a full variety of things that go beyond simply looking at the state as the source of the problem of the natural resource curse. At the same time, we started with a specific country, but we want to highlight that each country has its own unique form and manifestations of this problem, and each country has its own history. There is not one cookie cutter example of the natural resource curse, and there is thus not one cookie cutter solution. By continuing with the course, you'll see that we're proposing lots of uh, ways that we can mitigate this problem through a variety of approaches. And we'll move, we've embraced the natural resource curse theory put out by economists and political scientists, but we're also moving beyond. Thank you for joining me today.